Well, now we would like to have our meditation led by Hilary Stewartson. Actually, I'm going to do something a little different this morning. Rather than doing a three-minute meditation, I want to tell you a little about meditation. You know, a lot of people sort of think meditation is woo-woo. So I'm here to tell you about the results of some of the studies that have been done on health benefits. The National Institutes of Health conducted a mortality rate study on people aged 55 and older. The first group practiced transcendental meditation, and the second group used other relaxation methods for achieving improved health. The study was conducted for eight years. The findings were that those practicing meditation lived 30% longer than the people in the control group. That's a pretty remarkable result. They also reported a great reduction in common stress-related problems such as anxiety, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. Another study featured in the American Journal of Hypertension reported that a group of people doing meditation had a 23% reduction in the use of hypertension drugs compared to those who didn't meditate. And the American Heart Association informs us that Numerous studies have shown that meditation can increase the arterial <laughs> artery health by at least 69% when done regularly. What we usually do here at Open Circle for about three minutes is not a meditation. It is usually a visualization. One needs silence or only soothing music to meditate. That way you can calm your mind too. It is recommended that if one is meditating, that you meditate for 15 to 20 minutes twice a day. To do this, you find a quiet place, sit straight back on a chair with your feet flat on the ground and hands resting on your thighs. You can also do this lying down or sitting cross-legged. I never could do that one. Um, <laughs> but it is important that you feel comfortable. And it's always best are also best to do the same time every day so that it becomes part of your daily routine. So what you do when you're sitting down in this chair, you close your eyes and you start to relax with every breath, deeper and deeper and deeper, you relax. And then to calm your mind, you mentally focus on repeating a mantra. This is simply a word or several words. And it's best to choose a word that has no meaning for you, so that your mind doesn't go on and off in all directions. Sometimes using a word from a foreign language works, where you don't know what it means, but you just like the sound of it. And some people use the OM sound. They can sound it out loud or mentally. But remember, you are in a quiet place, so you're doing this just for yourself. If you find your mind wandering, then gently bring it back to focus on your mantra. You want to relax your body and your mind. So, for good health, why not try meditation? It can't wait. <laughs> if we all look to be 30% older, imagine. <laughs> Our speaker today is Art Thorkildsen. His name suggests he might be son of Thor himself, right? <laughs> as tall, slender, and graceful as the prow of a Viking ship. He's a story writer and storyteller of Norwegian extraction. Hi, dear. Today, 
Today he's going to tell us all about the explorers, the rise and fall of the British Empire, the last place on earth, the South Pole, I guess. He's backed by popular demand. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm always amazed when I walk around here as to why and how they managed to plant that tree in such a beautiful place. It just seems to be with the arms. Who, could, who, could, who came up with that idea? Neil James. Uh, Neil James. <laughs> this morning, a couple of things before I get started. We went to immigration on Tuesday morning to arrange our FM3 pictures and fingerprints of every finger, all 10 of them. While we were there, we had the opportunity to speak to a gentleman by the name of Mr. McGregor, who was having all kinds of problems with his paperwork. It might be someplace between here, Oaxaca, Mexico City, or Veracruz. Considering all, he said, it is easier to love Mexico than trying to understand it. <laughs> I've always wondered about the word experience and what, it, and what its value is. And now that we're all 60, 70, and 80 years old, one would think that we have accumulated some knowledge, some experience, been there, done that. So what is the value of it all? I shall tell you. A younger man is out driving his car when he hears a noise under the hood. He, <clears throat> he goes into the garage and asks, can you fix it? An elderly, gray-haired gentleman comes out, opens the hood, takes out his hammer, and goes, doink. The noise is gone, and the young man says, how much do I owe you? The man says, $49.50. He says, $49.50. I want an itemized bill. <laughs> the man goes inside, and he says, all right, Use of the hammer, 50 cents. Knowing where to knock. <laughs> so now you know that the value of experience is at least $49. Some friends of ours, Tom and Mary, came up from Mazelbaum, and Tom asked, what are you working on? And I said, I'm working on something for Open Circle. And he says, what is Open Circle? And I said, well, it's a little bit of this and some of that. And then it came to me. It came to me. Forrest Gump. <laughs> Do any of you remember the movie Forrest Gump? An absolute classic. Run, Forrest, run. Forrest is sitting on a park bench with a box of chocolates when he says to the lady next to him, my mama always said to me, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. And that is open circle. <laughs> open circle is like a box of chocolates. You come here every Sunday morning, and you never know what you're going to get. <laughs> the Explorers. In 1492, the world was flat. If you sailed too far west, you would fall off the edge. So said all the learned men at the time, and all the learned men were priests, bishops, cardinals, and of course the Pope. Rome knew best. And while the explorers and the people living there knew the Mediterranean and a little bit of the west coast of Africa, that was it. Christopher Columbus tried to convince the king and Portugal for five years that he could find India by sailing west. 
the king and his advisors thought otherwise. And so Columbus went on his donkey with his plans to Spain and tried to convince King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, but they were too busy fighting a war trying to, trying to unite Spain under them. And they were also trying to expel all Jews, Moors, Muslims, and burning of all non-Catholics at the stake. The first Grand Inquisitor was a Dominican monk by the name of Tomas de Torquemada. He died in 1496 and was replaced by a worse zealot. It took the world another 200 years before burning at the stake and the witches of Salem, Massachusetts. They also happened in France and, of course, Queen Mary of England, known as Bloody Mary. But the final chapter on the Spanish Inquisition did not officially end until 1854, 350 years later. Finally, after 10 years and through a lot of planning and talking, the help of a benefactor who believed in Columbus, he finally got his three little ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Within six months, Columbus was back. The new world had been found, and in the year 1500, the age of exploration, the age of discovery began. The world was not flat. We did not sail off the edge and the search for spices, new lands, territories, and empire. Riches and gold fed the imagination. The news spread and the search for El Dorado had begun. Columbus brought back to Europe after his first voyage tobacco and syphilis. <laughs> <laughs> and he left the New World <clears throat> with the European diseases, <clears throat> which within 100 years exterminated nearly half of the indigenous population of the Caribbean. Smallpox was the worst. In 1500, all the explorers moved horizontally. 513 years later, the explorers will move vertically because the future is not out there. The future is up there. The British Empire and you have to bear in mind that this is my version. It is but a snippet of history. It is not the official historical version that you can find in your history book. The sun never sets on the British Empire. That was the motto of the times, and it was true for over 450 years. Columbus may have discovered America, but the British discovered the world. At its height, it was the biggest and it was the largest empire in history. England covered all the continents, and the Union Jack flew over all, and the people sang, Rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves. We shall never, never, never be slaves. But no more. The first colony was Newfoundland, then Jamestown and the Puritans, and the last was Hong Kong. England still has a few territories and protectorates around the world, the Falklands and Georgia, sheep are included, an interest in Cyprus, an uninhabited rock in the middle of the Atlantic, a military base in the middle of the Indian Ocean, and maybe even an interest in Pitcairn Island the home of the mutineers of the HMS Bounty. Fletcher Christian, the mutineer, took his men and his women from Tahiti to Pitcairn Island, where they set up home after destroying and burning the Bounty. There was no going back. In a few years, they had all vanished. They ended up by killing each other. Captain Bly, who was set adrift in a small boat with his 29 men, 
sailed on for 49 days and 3,900 miles to the Dutch East Indies, an amazing journey of survival and seamanship. Years later, Captain Bly became governor of New South Wales, Australia. An even more amazing tale of English seamanship was Ernest Shackleton's journey by dead reckoning from Elephant Island in the Antarctic to South Georgia, a trip without a compass of 800 miles. The Englishman. From this little island, the English sailor, the captains, the explorers, set out to find the world. And they did. The Portuguese went out, so did the Dutch, the French, and the Spaniards. But the British were like bulldogs. They were also raiders, privateers, pirates. They wanted the gold, they wanted the spices that the Portuguese and the Dutch had. They wanted the trade, they wanted the cotton and the, and the Darjeeling tea of India. They kept what they found and then took by hook or crook everything else one way or another from the Dutch and the Portuguese defeating the French at Trafalgar, burning all their ships and by force anyone else who was in their way. It was the British Bulldog. They fought on battles on land and on the seven seas. They sailed on and on. They came and traded and they sent people out to run the trading stations, to hold the harbors, to populate the area. They might lose a battle, but eventually they won the war. One thing you have to bear in mind is there never was a grand plan, a grand plan for empire. England never set out to dominate the world, but the world was there and England found it. They took it and they kept it. The empire rose from little pieces here and there. It just kept growing. They defeated the Barbary pirates. They owned the Mediterranean Sea. They kept Malta and they kept the rock, Gibraltar. King George lost his 13 colonies and kept Canada. Captain Cook found New Zealand, Hawaii, and Australia. They had British Honduras and the Virgin Islands and many more ports of call in the Caribbean. But then England took on Africa, South Africa, Egypt, Rhodesia, Somalia, India, and Singapore, and Hong Kong. And more places in the Caribbean as well. England beat Napoleon and the Dutch, the French and Spain. They ruled over all, some good and some bad, mostly for good spices, trade and felt. They protected their pocketbooks and their attitude was we know best and for the greater time they were correct. They brought peace to many countries, they brought the railroads and technology as long as there was a profit in it. And as long as it served God, country, and King, and Queen Victoria. Religion played an important role in England's plan for the empire. They were not about to let Catholic France or Spain or the Pope have any role or influence at all. The Anglican Church ruled and was in charge. And of course, they subjected the peoples to British rule. Their navies ruled the seas and the armies the land. The British colonials administered the world. They purchased the Suez Canal. It was the empire's artery. If you have the canal, might as well run the country of Egypt, which they did for 75 years until Colonel Nasser took it back. And then, in 1956, Anthony Eden, the Prime Minister of England, decides to take it back again, this time by war. President Eisenhower told Eden that the United States would sell all U.S. reserves and the British pound sterling, 
thereby collapsing the British currency. A humiliating defeat withdrawal ensued and Anthony Eden resigns. After World War I, England, with the help, <clears throat> with a little help from the French, and of course Lawrence of Arabia, ran and ruled the Far East. A few British colonials divided Iran, Iraq, Turkey, Armenia, Georgia, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, the Emirates, and Palestine. They certainly, at a time with Israel, who at the time did not exist. The British colonials ruled, they were in charge. World War II and the end of empire. First it was, while England won World War II, it was then the beginning of the end of the empire. The writing was on the wall. Europe was free. It was 1945. 1945 was a terrible year. It was the end of two wars, Europe and the Pacific. Yes, it was the end of something. But it was also the beginning of the greatest changes that the world has ever seen. Atomic power, jet airplanes, TV and cell phones, the pill, a cure for polio. More changes have happened in these last 60 years than the previous 10,000. The jewel in the crown. Queen was no longer Empress of India. India in 1947 belonged to Mahatma Gandhi. East Pakistan and then West Pakistan. East became Bangladesh and West became Pakistan who now has their own atomic bombs as well as India with theirs. Then came Africa the Mau Mau of Jomo, Kenyatta, and Kenya, the apartheid of South Africa, Mr. Cecil Rhodes of Rhodesia is gone. Now it is Mugabe and Zimbabwe. Then the Caribbean, British Honduras is now Belize, and on and on. And then there was the IRA and Ireland, taking a terrible toll on both England and Ireland. The 40s, the 50s, and 60s were trying times for the MPs and the Prime Ministers of England. And now comes the elections in September in Scotland. Will they also say goodbye to the Empire? A little story. Mahatma Gandhi is in South Africa in 1895, when he encounters a wasp, a tall, thin, white, Anglo-Saxon Protestant missionary in shorts with skinny and bony knees. <laughs> the wasp tells Gandhi that he would be a wonderful Christian. The Mahatma looks up at the tall, thin, white, Anglo-Saxon Protestant missionary with the shorts and the long, skinny, bony knees, and says, It is nice of you to come all the way from England to South Africa to tell me, a little Hindi man, that I should become a Christian. But you do not see me going all the way to England to tell you to become a vegetarian. <laughs> Empire <clears throat> and the world has had many. 
the Russian, Napoleon, and the French, the Aztecs, the Romans, the Ottomans, they who knocked on the doors of Vienna, Austria, the Austria-Hungarian Empire, the Spanish, the Dutch, the Egyptians, the Japanese, the Chinese, ah yes, and the Mongols of Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan, in 1956, did you miss seeing the greatest movie that Hollywood ever made? It was a masterpiece, and it was called The Conqueror, starring as Genghis Khan, John Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> Drooping mustache, uplifted eyebrows, and also starring Susan Hayward as the virgin Mongol princess. <laughs> Okay, children, match your horses and let's go plunder, said the Duke. I saw this movie in 1956 in San Diego, and it has never been shown since. <laughs> never. And I hope it never, ever is. I, I mean... Hollywood does some strange things, but give me a break. John Wayne. Gee. The British Empire. Say what you want about the British Empire. It's good and it's bad. It was a different time. But it did become, and it was the greatest and largest empire in history. It far surpassed any other Roman or Ottoman. And it became the greatest for many reasons, but it also lost it for many reasons, the main one being each country's call for independence. Every country and every person wants to be free, to be independent, reluctantly and in some cases kicking and screaming, but eventually England granted those wishes, but they still kept a hold on one little place, the last place on earth, the South Pole, and that is the next part of our story. What has England and the Empire left us with? Certainly America, Canada, Ireland, Scotland, Belize, New Zealand, Australia, but the most important thing of all, the English language. It is the language of the world, it is the language of diplomacy, it is the language of commerce. No other language in history has become as important and far-reaching as the English language. And for that, we have to thank the English seamen and the English explorers. Wherever you travel in this world, you can always find someone who speaks English. A hundred years from now, will everyone speak English? The English gave us King Arthur and the Magna Carta, Shakespeare, Trial by Jury, the Beatles, and Monty Python. No other country or peoples have had as great of an impact on the world as the English and the, Eng and the English Empire. No one comes even close. The last place on earth. England sailed and explored more of the world than any nation in history. They opened up the dark continent of Africa Cook found Hawaii, New Zealand, and Australia. With only a few places left in the world to take a peek at, and so many captains banging on the door of the Admiralty asking for a place to sail to. The Lord said, how about the Northwest Passage? Off they went, and many never came back or failed to find it. One of the last explorers tried, and all on board died as a result of all the food 
being in zinc cans sealed by lead. The result was that they all died in northern Canada of lead poisoning. The one explorer who did find and complete the Northwest Passage was the Norwegian Roald Amundsen. The North Pole had been found at 90 degrees north by Admiral Peary that left only the South Pole, the last place on Earth. Many captains and explorers had come close to Antarctica, but ice and storms always drove them back until the Admiralty and the English National Geographic Society said, let's have a go at it. <laughs> so they found a volunteer, Captain Robert Falcon Scott, an insecure man looking for fame and glory, who set sail for the Pole with a third officer on board by the name of Ernest Shackleton. The crew adored Shackleton. Scott hated him and saw him as a threat and sent him back home. Scott failed in his first trip south, but would, but would return years later. Shackleton also returned in 1907 and came within 112 miles of 90 degrees south but ice, cold, hunger, and that terrible disease, scurvy, drove him and his men back. His ship, the Endurance, was crushed by the ice. So they sailed away in small boats to Elephant Island. From there, he and six men set off to South Georgia, 800 miles, without a compass, and they made it. He returned a year or almost two years later and saved all of his men from Elephant Island. Amundsen was prepared to go south, but Scott was not. Amundsen trained and lived with the Eskimos in Greenland and Canada for over two years. He studied their clothes, their diets, and knew you had to have fat in your diet. He ate seal, meat, and blubber. He knew how to use skis. Scott found them too difficult. Amundsen taught himself and his men to handle huskies and sled driving. He knew about scurvy. The English sailors died and suffered terribly over the 200 years from a lack of vitamin C. That was the cause of scurvy. Captain Cook, in his journeys, supplied his men with lemon juice, and no one got scurvy. Scott did not know how important diet was. He did not know how to survive at 60 below zero. Amundsen did, having lived in the North for years. Amundsen was a tough but a fair leader of his men. Captain Scott was not. He was the kind of person who had his favorites. Scott had huskies, but did not know how to use them. When he saw that the dogs ate their own poop, he was disgusted and would have nothing more to do with them. On Scott's second journey to the pole, he brought with him tractors. The first one sank while being offloaded. The second one froze up. Did someone say antifreeze? <laughs> he also brought with him 28 Siberian ponies and tons and tons and tons of hay to the South Pole. The ponies starved and then froze to death. Amundsen for months cached food and primus for his stoves every 20 to 40 miles. Back and forth they went, supplying and resupplying. So did Scott. Amundsen used dog sleds. Scott manhauled their heavy loads up and down the Beardmore Glacier. The South Pole is 9,000 feet above sea level. 
a million years of ice. Amundsen set flags out several miles in each direction stating where the food was. Scott used one flag. Amundsen's expedition benefited from careful preparation, good equipment and clothing, and his trek proved rather smooth and uneventful in contrast to Scott's journey south. Both Scott and Amundsen set forth for the South Pole within days of each other, going south 1,300 miles. Blizzard, snow blindness, and just misery, misery during the night and exhaustion, then up and at it again. Finally, they were at the plains. Amundsen skied and used the dogs to pull the sleds. Scott manhauled their heavy loads. Amundsen found the 90 degrees south and placed the Norwegian flag there on December 12, 1911. 34 days later, Scott and his men, after manhauling their heavy loads all the way up the Beardmore Glacier and onto the plain to 90 degrees south, in weather from 20 to 60 below, blizzards, hungry, frostbitten feet, only to find the Norwegian flag already there. Heartbroken, they could only return. But where was the food? Where was the pole sticking out of the ice? There was nothing, nothing in every direction but snow and ice, as far as they could see. Where was a warm place? Exhausted, snow blind, frostbitten, hungry, eating only one biscuit a day. And depressed, they laid down in their tents, 11 miles from food. Scott wrote his final words in his journal, laid down and froze to death with his men. Amundsen returned to Hobart, Tasmania and told the world he was a hero. He was a great hero until news of Scott and his men reached the world and then he became vilified. Amundsen was no longer the hero. Instead, he was the villain. It was not fair. It should not have happened that way. It was not crooked. Some years later, in 1928, an Italian count tried to fly over the North Pole in a blimp, was lost, Amundsen and friends set out in an airplane to search and was never heard from again. The South Pole is still there. Some places bear the names of these two explorers. The United States has a large research station there and so do the British. Some Russians and Chile is also there. Antarctica has now become a popular place for tourists as well. You can go, <coughs> you can take a cruise boat from Chile, go to Antarctica, and have your picture taken. <laughs> Two men, both wanting the glory, both wanting the prize, both reaching for the brass ring. Maybe they both won something but they also lost. Maybe there was no brass ring. A postscript to this story. In 1911, my father was on a Norwegian foremaster. He had sailed from Belfast, Ireland with a load of coal to Portland, Oregon. And from there, <coughs> he looked, and, and from he, he, where am I? 
He had a load of, of lumber for Valparaiso, Chile. And he found the news of Amundsen in 1912 while in Buenos Aires, Argentina. My father was one of the last of the Cape Horn sailors. The age of sail was no more. After two years at sea, he returned home as a rich young man. He had five dollars in his pocket. There is a man I'd like to introduce you to, an Englishman by the name of Noel Coward, a writer, an actor, composer, wit, and theatrical bon vivant. While on a trip to Malaysia in 1928, he wrote this lighthearted dig at British colonial society. In tropical climes, there are certain times of day when all the citizens retire to tear their clothes off and to smile. <laughs> it is one of the rules that the greatest fools obey because the sun is much too sultry and one must avoid its ultra-violent rain. The natives grieve when the white men leave their huts because they're obviously, definitely, nuts. <laughs> Mad dogs and Englishmen go up in the midday sun. The Japanese don't care to. The Chinese wouldn't dare to. Hindus and Argentines sleep firmly from 12 to 1. But Englishmen detesta a siesta. <laughs> in the Philippines, they have lovely screens to protect you from the glare. In the Malay states, there are hats like plates, which the Britishers won't wear. <laughs> At 12 noon, the natives swoon, and no further work is done. But mad dogs and English come out in the midday sun. It's such a surprise for the Eastern eyes to see that though the English are effete, they're quite impervious to heat. <laughs> when the white man rides, every native hides in glee, because the simple creatures hope he will impale his solar topi on a tree. <laughs> it seems such a shame when the English claim the earth, they give rise to such hilarity and mirth. <laughs> Mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. The toughest Burmese bandit can never understand it. In Rangoon, the heat of noon is just what the natives shun. They put their scotch and lie down and lie down. In a jungle town where the sun beats down to the rage of man and beast, the English garb of the English sahib Mele gets a bit more creased. In Bangkok at 12 o'clock, they foam at the mouth and run. But man, dogs, and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. The smallest melee rabbit deplores this foolish habit. In Hong Kong, they strike a gong and fire off a noonday gun to reprimand each inmate who's in late. In the main group swamps where the python romps that is peace from twelve to two. <laughs> Even Keller boo lie around and snooze, for there's nothing else to do. In Bengal, to move it all is seldom ever done. Not mad dogs <laughs> and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Okay, if you have a question, raise your hand and Jim will bring you a mic or somebody. Okay. Uh, the English introduced British law wherever they went, which is one of their legacies. And I wonder, uh, with all the independence that took place after World War II, did all these countries keep British law or have they changed? As, as far as you know. If, if, if I remember correctly, I think that most of them have kept some, some form of the old British court system. I could be wrong. Um, uh, I, would anybody like to know why the sun never set on the British Empire? It's because God didn't trust the bastards in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know your father? Did I know my father very well? Yes. And what kind of a ship? How, big, how many sails? How many days did it take him? Well, you're talking about two or three different things in here. Uh, I can tell you, when we left Norway in 1947, it took 14 days across the Atlantic. Now all you do is pick up the phone with your credit card and they ask you what would you like for dinner. <laughs> but my father, in uh, 1911, he was 16 years old. And so many uh, uh, Norwegians all went out on ships. They all went to sea. I mean, the sea is right there in front of your face. This is where you live the fjords and the North Sea, the Atlantic, whatever you want to call it. And his desire was to be just like Papa, just like his uncles, everybody else. And, the, and in those days, it probably was the only way to make a buck. He uh, first left Norway and ended up in Amsterdam. For Amsterdam, he went to Belfast, Ireland. He loaded up coal. He go all the way to Portland, Oregon, a strange place. But the reason for moving the coal from Ireland to Portland, Oregon, was to feed the, the, the coal-fired steamships that existed at the time. And the reason for going to Valparaiso, Chile, was that in 1911 there was an earthquake that destroyed Valparaiso, Chile. So the lumber that you see there now, if you go to a hotel, dead rotten. <laughs> Do I what, ma'am? Do you still sail? Do you sail? Only if you go with me. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I need a good crew. Here's another question. Uh, I have one quick question. I could probably go home and Google it, but. What was it specifically that uh, turned Amundsen from being a hero to a villain? I, I didn't understand. What, was, what did he do? What was he perceived to have done? It's, it, 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 it was when they found that, uh, that Scott had, had come so close with food and the tent and the primus and everything else and died 11 miles away from it. But you have to bear in mind that no matter where that particular tent had been, at that time, I'm not sure that Scott and his men had the energy to go further than a mile or two a day. It depends so much on, I mean, the feet, uh, one man's feet were frostbitten and probably would have had them uh, amputated if memory serves me right. It, it was just one of those times but I think that when you hear a hero that's come in town 90 degrees south, and then you hear the other side of how badly it was for Scott and his men that they found the four frozen bodies, you know, laying in there in the tent there several months later. It just sort of, uh, it, 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 the, the story destroys itself, you know, within itself. First you're a hero, and then you're a villain going in, and you succeeded, and he didn't. 
He's about to sit down again. So. <laughs> this might be it. I don't see any okay. more hands. And thank you very much. I, I just have a quick uh, announcement here. Uh, next week is the time change. So, which way does the clock go? Forward. Ahead, forward. Right, okay. So remember, be here next Sunday. Next Sunday we're uh, going to have Dr. Nancy Banks present uh, a lecture on evidence-based medicine. Does it really exist? She asks, what if 90% of the peer-reviewed clinical research, the holy grail of the conventional medical system, is exaggerated or worse, completely false? Uh, Nancy Banks is a primary care physician, obstetrician, and surgeon, and she will discuss how the medical consumer can better access therapeutic, better assess therapeutic options and make better informed decisions. So none of us want to miss that. So that concludes our time today and uh, you can turn your cell phones back on and please pick up your coffee cup and stack your chairs. Thank you for coming.